few days later, we were sitting in a dive bar in San Francisco's Mission District with Mark, a somewhat scruffy young reporter in a leather jacket. Mark has a Mediterranean features, wavy black hair and ample beard stubble. He takes a deep pull on one of those artificial cigarettes that deliver all the nicotine with none of the illegal smoke, then opens up a cheap Chromebook that looks about 10 years old and starts typing furiously. The place smells of smoke that never quite came out of the retro upholstered furniture. It's the afternoon, so the place is mostly empty, except for some dedicated drunks and you too. Thanks for coming, Mark says, even as he's typing something different about the atmosphere of the bar. You'd be surprised how many people insist on just answering via email, but that's bullshit reporting. I'd like to I, I, it's like trying to sell the public a car you've only seen in a picture. To find the truth, you've got to kick the tires. You've got to look them in the eye. He looks you in the eye. Like, right now. I can basically tell you're a nice guy, he says, going back to typing. You're trying to do right by people. Haven't had to stick anybody in the guts to get what you want, he hesitates. That's a compliment. Thanks, you say awkwardly. The bartender. A tattooed and farrowly pierced young woman with the build of a roller derby wire approaches Mark. PBR, Mark says lightly, as if it's just a reminder. The bartender then looks to you expectantly. PBR for me too. Got any like chocolate coffee porters? I have the Miller High Life, please. Champagne of beers. Guinness for strength. Just water for me. Guinness for strength. Mark nods in approval at your choice of beers. The bartender leaves to fill your order. What's your initial impression of Mark? I don't think this guy and I are going to get along. Or seems like an interesting guy. I think we'll get along okay. Or kind of mysterious, kind of cute. I'm wondering if it's against his professional ethics to go on a date with me. Um, seems like an interesting guy. As you make this decision, Mark glances at you and types another brief note to himself. He seems very good at reading people. So, I've heard your robot is kind of like a robotic four-year-old, and it loves to ask questions and explore, and it's kind of bumbling in what may be an endearing way. Mark gives you a skeptical look to tell you what he thinks of this. I guess I ought to show you my robot sometimes, you say. Yeah. The bartender comes back with your Guinness and Mark's PBR. Guinness is a reliable staple in otherwise unpromising bars, and you find the pleasant taste of the dark beer refreshing. Oh, I like Guinness. I like me some Guinness. So let's go to the most interesting of the rumors, Mark says. Does this robot have human-level intelligence? The way Mark studies your expression suggests that your answer will say as much about you as it will about Ariel. You should see Ariel while she is learning from the internet. It's only a matter of time before she surpasses us. Or, yes, Ariel is absolutely the equal of any human. Or, intelligence is a concept designed by elites to denigrate your lower classes. Ariel is what she is. Or, no, she's still got a lot to learn. Or, no, Ariel's mind is a pale imitation of human intelligence, which most people underestimate. Hmm. Um. And I want the stats. Um, autonomy 15 good, empathy 15 good. I'll go with. Yes, Andrew is absolutely equal. Mark studies you for a moment to decide whether you are full of it. He then shrugs, conceding that you at least believe what you say and writes down your answer. Let's talk about your advisor then. Professor Zigor is famous for his pronouncement that in the near future we will have robots smarter than humans. What role did he play in creating this robot of yours? He had nothing to do with it at all besides providing the funding. Or he demanded that the robot appear more useful to the military without contributing significantly to, to its intelligence. Or he provided some suggestions during the robot's construction. Or I was greatly inspired by his thinking. I was listening to him speak of NPR as a robot was being built, in fact. Huh. Well, Sigur is a douchebag, but he's a professor. I, will, I should show some respect. I was great to inspire. So you think it's perfectly reasonable to be happy about the prospect of machines replacing people, Mark said. 
It's been happening throughout the history anyway, you say. Nobody in particular gets upset these days that scribes have been replaced with scanners. Mark takes a moment to type out that sentence verbatim. Mark pauses and is typing for a moment to give you a skeptical look. But for creative work, do you think robots will replace people in journalism, say? Absolutely, journalism is simply recording a log of some events that's easily within reach of current technology. That's gonna piss him off. Yeah, he already doesn't like me very much. Yes, once my robots are ready for the workforce, they will be ready for any job for which they are trained. No, professions that require understanding greater context will be off limits from robots for a while. Let's go with this one. Yeah, that, that pleased him. <laughs> makes sense, Mark says with a nod. He makes a brief note of your answer. So who is currently funding this work, Mark says. I'm being funded by US Robots, my friend's robotic company, you say. They make robots, robot stuffed animals. Are they anything like your own robot? Mark asks. I designed them, <laughs> you reply. Mark makes a note of this and you pat yourself on the back for managing to successfully advertise John's company. Yeah, I'm a good guy. Good guy, Greg. Uh, Mark asks a few more questions about Ariel, getting a sense of what she's good at and not so good at. He appreciates the effort you put into trying to make Ariel get along with people, while Quiro expressing doubt that she would really understand. He expresses concern that Ariel seems to be somewhat unpredictable in her actions. Do you think robots might turn on their masters or run amok? Mark asks. That is silly. Ariel loves me. I don't know, I would sound like a nut. I'm more concerned that people mistreat the robots. They need to be able to protect themselves. Uh, that doesn't sound right either. You've been watching too many movies. I programmed Ariel to place a high value on human life. That's all there is to it. Or Nietzsche once said, one must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. You can have creativity without a little chaos. I'll go with the third one. Does it consider itself to be human? Mark asks. You've actually, you are actually not entirely sure. Ariel has learned so much on her own since you initially programmed those values. She might consider he herself to be human. Uh, now that you mention it, she probably does. No, Ariel knows she's a robot. You'd have to ask her. Mark raises his eyebrows at this, but he dutifully takes down your response. Okay. Last question, Mark says. Will you allow us to send a photographer to take pictures of your robot? Absolutely. In fact, you're welcome to come along. Come you're welcome to come alone and interview Ariel. Yeah, that's what she wanted, so I'm gonna respect her wish. Really? Mark asks surprised. I know a lot of robotics wouldn't allow such a thing because a robot only works in a very controlled environment. Oh, roboticists. I never saw this word before. I know a lot of roboticists wouldn't allow such a thing because the robot only works in very controlled environments, you explain. That's why I want you to meet Ariel. She's different. Mark nods. I guess she is. We'll be in touch. A few days later, Mark comes to her apartment with a photographer. A young blonde woman with a slight southern drawl. She asks Ariel to sit on your workbench, then asks you to look as if you're busy fixing something on Ariel's person. But Ariel refuses to sit still and continually walks up to the photographer to inspect her camera. Eventually, the photographer gives a smaller, disposable camera to Ariel to play with, and she takes a picture of Ariel turning the thing over in her hands. Once the, photo once the photos are taken, Mark tries his hand at interviewing Ariel. He looks cautious and slightly guilty, as if the journalism police were going to pop out from a closet and take away his license. He places his Chromebook on your workbench and interviews Ariel, who examines the tools in your toolbox, toolbox occasionally fumbling and dropping a tool with a loud clatter. So, Ariel, Mark coughs uncomfortably. What's it like being a robot? It's like being a human once you are plastic instead of... <laughs> it's, it's like being a human only you are plastic instead of squishy, Ariel says. So you see yourself as not very different from human, Mark says. Yes. Mark blinks and dutifully records Ariel's response. What kinds of things make you happy? The internet, discovering new facts, practicing new abilities, the presence of master, 
Ariel cocks her mask head to the side. There is a significant gap between those and the next most highly ranked answers, but I could go on. That's alright. Mark continues his questions. You get the feeling that overall Mark is going to write a pos positive piece about Ariel. His questions tend to be friendly, as if he were interviewing a celebrity. You feel reasonably comfortable allowing Ariel to finish the interview and the photographer takes several more pictures of Mark talking to Ariel. By the end of the interview, Ariel seems to be enjoying her interaction with Mark. Plus empathy. Did he change the stats? Yeah. He, he likes us now. You spend the next two weeks searching newsfeed for your name and wondering every day when Mark's article is going to come out. You are awoken on Friday, March 13th, 2020 by a klaxon. A script you've wrote on your laptop uh, has detected Mark's article on the internet. You literally sit up in bed and stop your laptop's alarm. It's about 5 in the morning. Ariel walks into your bedroom to see what's the matter, but you assure her that everything's fine. So she goes back to trying to build a life-sized fire hydrant out of Legos. You don't ask. The article in the headlines The article is the headline story for the day with the photo of Ariel taking up the amount of real estate usually reserved for the end of a war. The robot age begins, superhuman intelligence achieved, proclaims the headline in bold, long letters that reminds you of the opening of Star Wars. The article talks mostly about Ariel and her curious outlook on life, weaving out most of the details of her creation. The article emphasizes Ariel's eager curiosity about the world and her rapidly her rapid ability to learn more. You find that Mark has also interviewed Josh as the CEO of US Robots. Our robot stuffed animals are second to none, Josh claims, and I have Rudolph to thank for it. Not only comprises your tireless efforts to help Josh even as you were busy throughout grad school, with selective use of quotes from your interview, the article portrays you as an essentially good person Albeit one driven by a goal few other people would completely understand. The article concludes you with your quote. Nobody particularly gets upset these days that scribes have been replaced with scanners. Wow, plus five fame. Oh hell, Wikipedia page. Will you, what will you do now? Oh, we got achievement unlocked, celebrity. Well, I can show Ariel the article, call Mark, thank him for the article and see what he's up to or share the article with friends and family via social media. I want to show Ariel the article. Ariel! Ariel walks back into your room and you show her the article. It's about me, Ariel says, cocking her head to one side. Yes. It says I'm more intelligent than a human, Ariel says. She seems to like this idea. Don't let it go to your head, you say. But you can tell it already has. Plus two autonomy minus two empathy. Oh no! You briefly check the internet for more posts about the article. You find that the story has been picked up within the first hour by a multitude of bloggers, all striving to be first to comment on the article. You would guess there is at least 700, 490 different bloggers who have already written a second-hand piece about you and Ariel, and they run the gamut from people hoping that your technology will save humanity to people who bitterly condemn you for creating technology that can be used for war. All the way, not one of the bloggers have tried to get in touch with you. But you soon start to get phone calls from more reporters. Supply interviews to as many reporters as possible. Be selective on answering questions from highly reputable organizations. Or politely, be selective. You decline most interviews, but decide to speak to Scientific American, National Public Radio, and the New York Times. You find that, on the whole, they are rather less biased than Mark, and they limit themselves to more or more to the facts. Nevertheless, when your interviews show up quickly on their websites, you realize that they don't have much time to fact check while playing catch up on a news story, and some of the things you said are garbled in the retelling, plus fame. Ellie is calling via a video chat on your phone, you pick up. Hey, she says. She looks like she's at work. She's dressed in a snappy black jacket with a red blouse. And in the background, you can see blueprints and sketches of robots drawn in spare. Efficient lines. You didn't realize she worked for a robot company. Congratulations on the article. You must be really proud. Honestly, I could use a break. Did you talk to Mark? And if you did, what did you say exactly? 
Actually, I was wondering if that article convinced you, convinced you to join our company. Our thanks, I'm pretty proud. I'll talk to you later. Um, let's see if we can convince her to join our company. Emma nervously looks over her shoulder. I'm at work now, she whispers. I can see that, you say. And I can see you design great robots. You've got a way better aesthetic sense than I do. What do you say? Emma looks over the shoulder again. Okay, but no military robots. We have a deal? Deal. Deal, Emma hangs up before you get the chance to say anything else. You smile to yourself. Emma will be joining your company. This day just keeps getting better. You're getting a phone call. According to the caller ID, it's mom. As your finger hesitates over the answer button, a second call appears on the screen. A number in Glendale, California. Probably a reporter? Um, take the call from mom. Your phone, show, well, your phone shows mom in her office cubicle, which is decorated with baby pictures of you and cute cat memes from the early days of the internet that she has printed out. Mom is wearing a corduroy, a lime green jacket with 80s style padded shoulders. Her image freezes constantly. You think she hasn't paid for enough bandwidth for this to work well. Just thought I'd offer my congratulations. I saw the article. My little guy is famous. The Glendale number is calling again. Um, keep talking to mom. 